Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host, Captain Martinez, and this is The Daily <laughs> Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is John Campia. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. <laughs> also joining us, Christian Harloff. Hey, it's Tony Ravioli. Why? What's going on? Hey, why? Why not? Hey, we got a pirate over there. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us is John Schnepp. Hey. Oh, hey, thank you, Captain hey, Martinez. Hey, what hey. does SAT stand for, Christian? It means stop and turn around because it's movie talk. Oh, hey, yeah, I what thought it do? was sausage and tomato. What's hey, going you on over here? Go Look at this guy. Hey, He's Italian John and he not to talk to that guy. <laughs> Stugas. All right. <laughs> On that note. What's first? <laughs> okay, THR reports that two of Pixar's most high-profile projects are swapping release dates. The Incredibles 2 will now arrive in theaters on June 15th, 2018, while Toy Story 4 will move to the Incredibles' original spot of June 21st, 2019. The change is due to an accelerated production schedule on Incredibles 2. Brad Bird returns to helm the superhero family's second adventure, as does Toy Story and Toy Story 2 director John Lasseter for Part 4. John, what do you think about Pixar swapping dates for Incredibles 2 and Toy Story 4? It's wonderful. And there's a couple of reasons why I'm very excited about this. Number one, lots of times, even big, massive studios will say, we're working on this movie and this movie's going to come. And then it never comes. So when we finally heard, you know, a decade later, that they're finally going to do The Incredibles 2, we were all super excited and stoked, but not a lot of words have come out about it in a long time. It was set off to 2019, never heard much. And so there was always that little bit of me that was wondering, is this actually gonna happen? Hearing that they're actually fast tracking it, moving it up a year, because The Incredibles is the best Fantastic Four movie we've ever had. And it is just and one of the best movies Pixar has ever done. And one that probably, out of any film that Pixar has done, it is the one film that truly was begging for a sequel. Now, I love that they did Toy Story 2 and 3, I liked Monsters You very much, but the one original film they did that was begging for a sequel and that everybody wanted was The Incredibles. Moving that up a year is great. And here's another reason why this is okay. Toy Story 4 is a film I'm very much looking forward to. I am. But I've been waiting longer for The Incredibles. And so to change orders on that is great. And you know what? Toy Story 3 was such a satisfying ending and all that kind of stuff that I feel satisfied. I don't feel that need to have another one right now. So I'm glad it's coming. Push it off another year. Swap it with The Incredibles. I think this is smart all the way around. Schnepp, what do you think about this move? Yeah, I mean, like you said, they've, got, they've already had two sequels to Toy Story. No mm. sequels to The Incredibles. It makes sense. I'm, I'm very happy. I was like, look, and John Lasseter returning to direct... Uh, Toy Story 4 is great. They got Brad Bird. Get that out there. I can't wait. I'm, it makes me have to wait a year less is awesome news. And, and compounding this is the fact that, once again, they're reaffirming Brad Bird is returning to direct this. Yeah. So, I don't know. You hear about this news, Christian. Good move? Bad move? What do you think? Smart move and a good move because it, it, it is the one that, and you're not the only one to think that Incredibles is the one to have the sequel. I mean, it, it's you look at any comment section or anything when they announce new Pixar movies, why isn't Incredibles 2? Finding Dory's coming out. Why not Incredibles 2? Yeah. Cars 2's coming out. Why not Incredibles 2? It comes up all the time because it was so popular and because it was such a well-received film. And it really does make sense to do that because Toy Story 4, I love the Toy Story movies. All three, it's very hard to make three incredible movies, no pun intended, mm -hmm. like that. And But people weren't calling for a fourth one. Some people thought maybe just leave it where it was because the three movies were so great and the third one ended so well. I happen to really want to see a Toy Story 4, but I would rather see Incredibles 2 first and then get excited that Lasseter is coming back for Toy Story number four. I think that's that's a good move to have him there. I think you'll get more excitement there. And I think that once you get that, well, what about, because that's what would happen. That's what was going to happen. That's fine. Toy Story 4 is coming out, but I can't wait until next year when Incredibles comes out. Now it's the reverse. And I think it's now that you get Incredibles. Oh, that's cool. Now what's next? Oh, Toy Story 4. I think it's a better way to market it. And it will be 14, even moving it up to 2018, it will yeah. be 14 years since the original. Oh, Which is terrifying. Crazy yeah. when nutty. you think about that. Like, hey, how much longer do we have Coach around? to come back and voice Mr. Incredible. Right. I mean, so like, I, I know he's not, yeah. like, he's not decrepit or anything right. like that, but I mean, you want to get moving on this. Look, I, I think one of the other important things of this that keep everybody excited is that John Lasseter, who did direct the first two story films, is coming back on board to direct story, Toy Story 4. Not that Toy Story 3 was suffering from his lack of presence there. And look, I'll say this too. Toy Story 3 
and probably Toy Story 2, in my opinion, were better movies than The Incredibles. Mm. The Incredibles is awesome, but Toy Story 2 and 3 were both practically perfect movies but in every sense. But if you put, I want to ask everybody here this question. Even though I think Toy Story 3 and Toy Story 2, in my personal opinion, were better than The Incredibles, if Toy Story 4 and Incredibles 2 came out the same day tomorrow, the first movie I'm going to go see is The Incredibles yes. 2. That's the first one I'm going to go see. Is that the first one you're seeing? Yeah, it's just, it makes a lot more sense. I mean, I've seen three great Toy Story movies. I've seen one. What's the next story to The Incredibles? I'm, I'm more curious to see what happens next in that story than I am with, with Toy Story right now. Chef, which one do you want to see first, if they're both out tomorrow? Obviously, Incredibles. But one of the things to me that's interesting is with Toy Story 3, they kind of you know, tied a bow on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Toy Story 3 kind of ends, and it feels like that's the end of this and they had even said, we're not making any more, yeah. any more Toy Stories. That's it. This, it ends with a very happy ending for all the toys. What? So where are they going is my interest in Toy Story 4. If they're going, and obviously they're going to go continue forward with The Incredibles, are they going to jump forward 10 years? Or is it going to be just like, you know, Baby Jack attack? Is he still a kid? You know what I mean? It's like... I hope the kids have grown up now. I would I like really to see do. some progression, yeah. but not too much. I don't want to see 15 years of progression. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like yeah. Maybe three years or something. It's, it's really hard to tell. Cartoons don't have to age if you don't want them to. So it's like, you're, that's the cool thing. Mark Simpson disagrees. Oh, wait. That's, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. That's right. Natasha, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Two questions. Number one, out of Toy Story 1, 2, and 3 and The Incredibles, which is your favorite? And if both Toy Story 4 and Incredibles 2 were in theater tomorrow, which one are you going to go see first? Okay, I would definitely see The Incredibles first just because Toy Story is so perfect the way it is. It's like I don't even want to touch it. I don't even know. Obviously, I'm going to see it because I love Pixar. I love everything that they do. But I was just so, like all of you guys said, so satisfied with all three of those Toy Story films, especially because, like, I relate so much with, like, timing-wise of, you know, their lives and everything. So I would definitely see Incredibles 2 first. And I, I don't know. I kind of want to see the kids at the age that, that we last saw them. Because I want to see their progression. I don't want to just be like, oh, okay, that happened. How? Wendy, what about you? <laughs> I am amped that they've pushed Incredibles 2 up. I've been waiting for the sequel to come out for a long time. Like you guys were all saying earlier, Toy Story 1, 2, and 3 have been perfect, and I feel like I grew up personally with the story watching Andy grow up through all these stories, but the third one ended so perfectly, I don't feel that I immediately need a fourth one to see what's going to happen with the toys, but I want to see what's going on with the Incredibles family. You know, but it does remind me a lot of the conversations that when Toy Story 3 was announced, a lot of people were saying, Toy Story 2 was perfect. Mm -hmm. We, why do we need another one? I'm damn glad they gave us another one because otherwise we wouldn't have Toy Story three. Toy Story three mm. made me cry. I'm angry. At I, that I know movie. it was. It's like right that. It's like you yeah, know they're not going to die. Furnace, yeah, that yeah. But furnace still, scene was that furnace, messed up. It, it wasn't the fear that got you. It was the emotion. Then when they're yeah. hold hands together, it's like we've been through this journey together. We're going to face the ending. I'm going to become a mess if we don't move on. <laughs> What's the next topic? We're all going to start crying. <laughs> According to a report from THR, Disney Studios is teaming with Ice Cube and Tony winning director of Hamilton, Thomas Kale, for a modern musical take on Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist. Oliver Twist tells the story of an orphan boy who moves from child laborer to being under the wings of Fagin, leader of a gang of London pit pockets. The new Oliver will be a modern musical crossing many genres, including hip-hop. Cube and Quatinets are writing the treatment with Cube attached to play Fagan. No release date has been set. Christian, what do you think about an updated Oliver Twist musical starring Ice Cube? Well, just to be clear, this dude's not in it. No, right? no, okay. Lin Manuel Miranda yeah. is not a part of it. Okay. The director uh, uh, is. Oh, producer, uh, the, right? the, yeah, the, well, he's not involved in it in any way. Okay. Uh, it was the guy who uh, was the director of of Ham Hamilton. Oh, okay. Is actually going to um, direct this film. Yeah. Yeah. I, this sounds like it could be something very interesting to where you're like, I'm about to sneeze. Not going to do it. All right, went away. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, I think. That, thank you. Well, it didn't happen. Uh, but I th this movie could be something like. Wait, I wasn't expecting anything like that. Wow, it delivered. Or it could just be a complete nightmare and just does not work to do. Sometimes it's very hard to do. Baz Luhrmann tries to do this type of stuff. Often, although he does it a little different, he still puts it in the period piece and puts modern music right. in it. Sometimes it works, and in, in, uh, whether you look Moulin at Rouge. Moulin Rouge, and, and then it doesn't for me in Great Gatsby. You want to see what they do here, but this is modern. This is modern. They're going to do a new tale. It depends on how it's delivered. It, it goes back to that conversation we have over and over and over again. It's about the team. It seems like it's a decent team. It's the guy who's been doing this so far it, it, it obviously had some success with Hamilton. 
it's Ice Cube who has had a lot of success over the years with with uh, with hip hop music. So this could be something that is shocking and that it is, becomes really a movie. I just don't know if I'm going to get excited about it yet. What do you think, Schnepp? As somebody who appeared in a stage production of Oliver, <laughs> right. what do you think about this? Oliver, <laughs> Oliver, never before has a boy wanted more. I'm available. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can just call that my agent. Get on that. I played yeah. Mr. Bumble. What's up? Um, you know what? It's actually exciting to see a hip hop version of Oliver hip-hop-ra, Twist. I like that. Yeah. Well, I've I, didn't never come, heard that I did not I... come up with that. Oh. MTV had done something with like a long time ago, and they were like, the very first hip hop I was like, that's cool. I never saw it. <laughs> oh. But, you know, I like the term. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great story. It's very worthwhile telling in a new version of it. I hope that they move it out of England and move it over here and, and make it relevant, you know, to kids now and adults now. And I think, you know, having Ice Cube play Baby Fagan. <laughs> because Fagen, London is not relevant. Well, <laughs> that's the message here today. Well, I'm not, so, not trying to get political talk about Brexit or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying time-wise, we're going to move it out of the... You guys know what I'm saying. Huh. Anyway, I, You're I not think it's nice. Been, yeah, <laughs> please, sir. I'd like a little bit more of this porridge. <laughs> um, not right now. <laughs> Soup going everywhere. You're such a visual storyteller. Yeah. <laughs> Soup everywhere turns a, fades into a you know, people on the street. The death of Oliver happen. Twist. What happened? <laughs> yeah, I uh, I like this news. Actually, I'm on board for this. I think this is an interesting idea. But you're right. This is one of those ideas that could be really sharp and really fresh and very original and very cool, but at the same time could be an unmitigated disaster. Yeah. I feel like this is one of those movies that if it takes mm-hmm. the slightest wrong turn, it's gonna come off the rails really fast. You know, Ice Cube is one of these guys that once in a while he turns out something really brilliant, once in a while he turns out something that is just completely and utterly forgettable. And when he's on his game though, he can be, a, number one, he can be a great producer. Yeah, and he has he, been lately. Yes, yeah. and he has been lately. And he can be a great performer. And how, what's the proper pronunciation? Is it Fagan that, yeah. he's, they, that he's playing? It's a good role for him to do. Bringing that whole Hamilton kind of mentality over to it, it could be really cool. So we'll just have to keep our eyes open. John Lovett's in it? <laughs> Hello, Oliver. <laughs> well, it wouldn't be bad. As long as they're like using Annie as a thing not to do. They're like, yes. everyone's probably like, we're not going to do what they did with Annie. Well, you know? the next casting is Jamie Foxx. They're going to bring him twist. over. And- <laughs> All right, guys, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Natasha has a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Natasha, what do we got? Two new TV spots have been released for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, with both spots putting the focus on the beast inside Newt Scamander's enchanted briefcase. Eddie Redmayne stars as Newt, a magi zoologist who travels to the Big Apple, where he causes quite the disruption when a few of his beasts escape from his suitcase. The movie is directed by David Yates based on an original screenplay screenplay by J.K. Rowling. It hits theaters on November 18th. Schnepp, buy or sell the new TV spot for Fantastic Beasts. Food, glorious food, <laughs> hot butter and popcorn. Um, yeah, I buy it. I think I, I actually bought the second commercial that I watched. I don't know, maybe in whatever order you watched that had all of the beasts in it because they look really cool. I mean, the more the more I've seen of the trailers for these movies, for this movie, Fantastic Beasts, the more I'm interested in it. Because when they first announced, I was like, they're just rocking that money. They want to get back on that Harry Potter train. It made a lot of sense. But then there's actually a cool new storyline with this character. And he's got to catch all these beasts a little bit like Pokemon, you know? Oh, I didn't even think about that. Thank you for ruining it for me. What do you think, Christian? <laughs> well, at the start, I felt like I was watching an episode of The Voice. Um, but uh, I, I, I can I turn my chair around? Yeah, you should, and leave it there. Um, I, I I don't know. I'm confused about this movie, and I'll tell you why. Because I'm I am a big Harry Potter fan. I do like that we're going back, and the story points and the things that I've seen so far, whether Eddie Redmayne or even Colin Farrell is chasing them. That's the type of stuff that I'm really looking forward to. I'm not crazy about the special effects so far that I've seen in the trailers. Uh, the, they they look they, when I notice it right away, and it seems to me like it's it's CGI. Like it, and I, that's when I start to go, oh, and I'm paying attention more to now how it looks than what the story is. And I don't think this movie's tracking so far from what I've seen. I've seen a couple things this morning. It's not tracking at the level that Warner Brothers thought it would. And, and even I, I was looking at Frosty's thing where he was saying it, this movie has to be great it can't be just good this movie has to be great and I agree so this movie so far it looks like I definitely want to see it I'm interested in I don't know if it looks like greatness yet um, but I'm certainly the, the things that I've seen in this trailer I like the story parts it's not crazy about the CGI 
I uh, I got I got to buy them. I and you know what? A lot of times, as somebody who worked in the visual effects industry, I can tell you a lot of times visual effects in movies when they play on a television screen don't That's quite look yeah. right. And then when you actually see them projected on the screen the way they're designed to be, they can look actually completely different than they do. Because I agree with you, like on the television screen, very, very CGI-ish, but I have a feeling when we see them on a screen, yeah, a good point. it'll convert. This was a movie that I did not believe in at first. I thought at first, Look, every the point of every movie for every studio is to make money. I mean, that's the point of every movie, I, so I get that. But this didn't really seem like a passion play to me when they announced this movie. It seemed more like a, we need another franchise. But to quote the great Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, greed is good. And that's, that's one of the things that's gonna help this movie, is greed. Warner Brothers wants to make oodles of money, and they want to make them not on one movie, they want to make them over five. They want to make five films wow. in this series, right? They know the only way that that's actually gonna work, and the only way they're gonna make the most amount of money that they can is if they make this one damn good. They know they have to make this one great. If they want this thing to be a five film franchise, you cannot have the train come off the rails. You cannot blow this one. I don't know that it has to be great, but at minimum, it's got to be really good. Well, great, great meaning that it's got it's it's in order for it to have these big numbers that they want it to hit, like yeah, Harry okay, Potter. Yeah, those numbers. numbers that's, yes, that's kind of what it's, I mean. you've got to get the people wanting to come back more right. and more. You've got to get that first wave. I'm not expecting a huge opening weekend for this movie, and I don't think Warner Brothers is either. What they have to rely on is that that one segment of Harry Potter fans that are going to go the first weekend that are then going to come out buzzing right. about it and tell all their other Harry Potter fans, "You've got to come see this." If they hit it out of the park, this could be a very profitable franchise. But once again, greed is going to help fans of Harry Potter here because it's going to force Warner Brothers to do as good of a job as they can. Doesn't mean it's going to work, but I think... I got uh, I to gotta add, I, I think it's going to be a smash hit opening weekend. Why? Because of the Potter fans. I mean, not only have they opened up all these like Potter verses all around, you can, their rides, just like Star Wars has its own little universe, there's a Potter universe, and those fans are, they're, it's a massive amount. So if you're, dis, you can't discount that love of the Potter universe. And now all those kids who grew up reading all of those Harry Potter books are now adults. A lot of them actually have their own kids. So yeah. this is like, people are just like Force Awakens, people are wanting this. So I think it's gonna be a giant hit. Uh, Mark Riley was just telling me that fan, right as of right now, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is tracking for a very impressive $75 million opening weekend. That's actually higher than I thought it would. So right, we'll 75 have to actually, is decent. I mean, <laughs> 75, especially for the time of right. year. You're saying way over that. Yeah. yeah. You, think, wait, you think it'll crack 100? Yes. Uh, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. All right, what's next? According to a report from THR, Kevin Hart is in negotiations to play Santa Claus in the <laughs> Disney family comedy entitled Dashing Through the Snow. The story will follow a New York City detective who doesn't have the best relationship with his son. The only thing that might be able to save their relationship is for the one true Santa Claus to make him believe in Christmas again. A release date has not been set. John, buy or sell Kevin Hart as Santa Claus in Dashing Through the Snow. Cannot sell this fast enough. And I am a Kevin Hart fan. I am an unabashed Kevin Hart fan. I like this guy. I love Central Intelligence. I like his stand-up comedy, I think is great. But this reeks of Tropic Thunder fake opening trailers. Yeah. Like, it, this just uh, reeks uh. of, hey, what if we had Kevin Hart playing Santa Claus? And and they go off and do it. I no, That doesn't mean the movie's not gonna be amazing. Maybe it will. But just on a concept level for me right now, I got to sell it. What do you yeah, think? I agree. I, I, the Tropic Thunder thing is a great reference. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking definitely it's like, you know, I want to play Santa Claus. Great. Okay, you want to play Santa Claus? How about this? That sounds good. I could do that. And then <laughs> that that's the movie. I don't think that it's going to be... I don't know. It, it's, it sounds like a, so he should... I want to see him. I know that he does comedy. That's what he does. That's his thing. I think that Kevin Hart has the ability to try. I want to see him start doing stuff similar to what like Jim Carrey did and what Steve Carell did. Let me see him do a couple dramas. We know that he's he's, he's going to do Jumanji now and action comedies and stuff like that. He's doing that. Can he do more? I think he can. I want to see him do more than stuff just like this. What do you think? Buy or sell? I will buy it if it's a hard R dashing through the snow <laughs> and it's him <laughs> getting like gritty it. with some elves, having issues, getting the toys out. I don't know the idea of him being a, an annoyed Santa Claus. I'm just thinking about it through my lens. It would be funny. Like like him having to deal with delivering toys and a bunch of like drunk elves or whatever. Like just imagine if the elves are like went on strike. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of different things that you can have fun with and make it like really just really 
dirty and raunchy. That to me, I would go see it that way. If it's like a family Bad Santa drama, three. yeah, or you know, but as real a real Santa having to right. deal with weird right. issues like reindeers that fly. I don't know if they did it that way. I would want to go see it. If it's like so goofy family drama, forget it. All right, what's next? One week after it was announced that Jennifer Lawrence would lead Ron Howard's biopic about Zelda Fitzgerald, THR reports that Scarlett Johansson is developing her own Zelda biopic with both films on the fast track, hoping to hit theaters first. The Johansson project is titled The Beautiful and the Damned and has Millennium Films financing with cooperation from the Fitzgerald <laughs> estate. The film will incorporate newly unearthed transcripts from a sanatorium in which Zelda Fitzgerald was confined, which also indicates that her husband misappropriated his wife ideas as his own. Millennium is currently circling a handful of directors for the gig, and no release date has been set. Schnepp buy or sell another Zelda biopic with Scarlett Johansson. Well, here in Hollywood, we th- th- there's like just like the Sith, there must always be two. Uh, we've got Deep Impact Armageddon. We have double Hitchcocks. We have double Hendrixes. We've got a couple of Kurt Cobain movies. We've got so you always have to have two of them, and this is. Unlike just like all those, I you know, uh, which one am I going to buy? I don't know yet. We'll have to wait to see which one. Jennifer Lawrence. Now you got Scarlett Johansson competing uh, Fitzgerald films. I'm going to buy it. I think it sounds great. It's it, competition is good. I sell this. I, I mean, look, I, I'm interested in the one that Jennifer Lawrence is doing. This is not one that requires two movies. This one doesn't require two movies. I don't know why they're doing a second one. How different of an angle and a take can you can you look at this? Um, I mean, look. It is anything surrounding F. Scott Fitzgerald, who died, I believe, at like 44. He was young when he died. And, and the, the nature of the relationship there and how her descent, in, as they call it, descent in madness. I mean, I'm interested in a movie about that. I'm not interested in two. And from what I'm reading about both projects, honestly, the one I'm more interested in is the Jennifer Lawrence one. Not because I prefer Jennifer Lawrence over, over the other actress. Not at all. I'm just saying that project sounds more interesting to me. I think they should stick to one. For me, it's a sell. Fought shired, fought shired. I think this is a definitely a shots fired type of thing because <laughs> I, you have you have um, you have both Scarlett Johansson and Jennifer Lawrence top of their game right now. Yeah, and a, we don't just because a lot of these times when these movies are announced, don't just assume that the Ron Howard one was the one that was in development first. Right. Because that happens a lot of times to where so they'll find out about a project and the studio goes, well, we'll do it and we can get so-and-so involved and we'll just get the word out first. And you think, and I'm not saying this is, this is what happened here, but it's certainly possible. I want to see the two of them play the role because if you look at something like Fassbender and Ashton Kutcher, both played jobs. Mm-hmm. Not fair to say who was better because right away, even if you didn't see the movie, well, of course Fassbender was. And I actually think it was Ashton Kutcher's best work. The movie was terrible. Though. But... I want to see what they both do. I'd like to see, because I think they both can pull off the role. And I'm I, sure they and, both can, yeah. But I think it also goes back to, you know, you tell me right now, the unknown director directing Scarlett Johansson, who, who is it, doing Johansson, uh, and then you have Bo, uh, Jennifer Lawrence by Ron Howard. I'm going to go, yeah, of course, let me see what Ron Howard and Jennifer Lawrence do. I don't know who's directing the other one. But then if they get a big name director on the other one and there's someone else, it becomes more interesting. So mm. I like the idea of it. I want to see what approach, obviously. I don't want to see the same story twice. Right. But I think it's interesting. I want to see what happens. You know what's? I, I think when you get these double movies, you usually do get something slightly different, especially with the approach to a biopic. Yeah. There's usually a different bend. So it'll be interesting to see if they both go the, the exact same way or if they veer off in different directions. What if in the Scarlett Johansson one, in the first five minutes, Zelda Fitzgerald is bit by a radioactive iguana? Oh, yeah. And then she develops powers. I would not uh, see that movie. Aww, <laughs> I, I contend you? that you would see no, that no, movie. I didn't see Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, <laughs> zombies. either. It's, oh, I have it's it on not my deal. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is actually pretty good. All right, because I saw Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter was killed terrible. it for me. It was killed absolutely that, terrible. Ver- that whole thing. Killed it. All right, what's next? <laughs> okay, for those wanting to remain completely spoiler free about what's to come in Star Wars Episode Eight, now is the time to tune out. So we'll issue a spoiler alert now. Okay, making Star Wars .net reports that a new character will supposedly be making their debut in the December 2017 release. Apparently, we're going to get a featured stormtrooper called the Executioner who will wield a weapon with three spinning blades on it with a new uniform having a matte black line that goes over half his mask in order to set him apart from the rest of the First Order stormtroopers. According to the outlet sources, Finn will follow up his fight with FN2199 by going head-to-head with the new baddie. Christian, buy or sell the rumored design for the new stormtrooper. Well, I'm going to buy it, and I'll tell you, 
first of all, if you're not familiar with makingstarwars.net, I'm just convinced it's like George Lucas because it, it, they, <laughs> they're George accurate. Lucas. I mean, they're they're accurate. They're they're I'd say 90 percent of their scoops are like dead on. They've got somebody on in the inside, so I buy that this is probably going to happen. And as far as the actual character going, yeah, I think it's kind of cool, but. If he's an executioner, let me see him execute. Don't just call him the executioner. He doesn't, and, and he's like every other stormtrooper, and he can't hit you if you're right in front of your face. So like mm. that, I want to see him be a badass, and I think we're going to get that with Ryan Johnson. I think that you don't hire Ryan Johnson on to just kind of do the. That's what Episode Seven was. We all know you either love or hate the fact that it was an homage to Episode Four. This is going to be something different. You're going to see characters like this. You're going to see executioner type stormtroopers. You're going to see, and and each character, one of our our protagonists, are going to have to go against new adversaries. And what we're going to find out that Ray and Kylo Ren are going to go head to head again, and Luke and probably Snoke. And then you're going to have Finn. Who's Finn going up against? He's got to go up against stormtroopers. That's where he is. That's his brother and their ex brother. And so let's see him go up against a guy like this. I dig it. I think it could be cool. And if it's executed right, the executioner could be cool. Mm. What do you think, Shep? Um, I want to see the design. I, I I fear it's another Captain Phasma situation where mm. they release something. It looks really cool. It's really, I mean, I, I, honestly, a lot of these things are to sell toys, which there's nothing wrong with that. You get a cool design. You want to sell those toys, get the, get the Executioner Stormtrooper because he looks badass. But I'm a, I'm a, in total agreement with you. Let's see him do some execution. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm very interested to see what he's going to look like. I also think Force Awakens was was episodes four, five, and six. They did a good, co they kind of combined those stories to reboot the Star Wars universe for new fans. So I'm really interested to see where Ryan Johnson goes in these newer directions, and let's see what happens with the Executioner Stormtrooper. Sounds cool, the description at least. Yeah, I, I'm into it, I, I buy it. I think this sounds good. I think it could be interesting depending on how it's used. I mean, it reminds me a little bit though, because we got the Executioner, and don't forget, we also got something called, coming in uh, one of the future movies called The Death Troopers. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Rogue, uh, Rogue One. That's yeah. coming up in Rogue One. Did you guys see, by the way, the second Kylo Ren reacts to the Rogue, no. to the no. second Rogue One trailer? No. It's not as good as the first, but he does say something. He's like, Death Troopers aren't like all Stormtroopers Death Troopers. <laughs> they either just kill people or get shot. I mean, that's all they're good for, which is kind yeah, of funny. Right. So, of course, he's an executioner. Um, it's, it sounds interesting to me. I do like the idea of going a little bit deeper into the thing, into the idea that these First Order troopers are trained in melee combat. Hmm. And so we saw that with uh, with the, uh, what are they called? The, the fan name form was Traitor. Uh, with, that, with this trooper that we see here, and we saw that with things. A lot of people are asking, how come Finn can use a lightsaber? Because he's trained in melee combat. And that's what you saw him. He's just used a different type of stick than he was used to. So if they do this well, and but that is my big fear. The same thing you brought up, Schnepp, is if it's another Captain Phasma yeah. situation. He's there. He's going to be in half of the new trailers. And then he's on screen for three minutes and disappears with, with no apparent influence on the story whatsoever. Right. That's what I'd be afraid of. But if they can avoid that, it could be pretty cool. What it does say, I, th I bet you we're going to get a lot of ground battles in this one, though, which is kind of cool. That also would be cool. Yeah. But I, I mean, I want to see some space battles now. I man. think we're going to get some of those yeah. too, but I think it's going to be a lot. I think it's going to be a mixture of both. I think we're going to see a lot. I think this movie's going to be a lot more epic in scale than even Force Awakens was. Mm. All right, what's next? According to an exclusive report from The Wrap, Bad Robot, and J.J. Abrams' upcoming film, God Particle will be the newest movie connected Bless to you. Cloverfield and 10 Cloverfield Lane. Not only will Particle be the third in the series, but Abrams and Paramount Pictures are creating more movies for the shared universe, with the studio hoping to release a new film every year. God Particle opens on February 24th, 2017. John, buy or sell a shared universe of Cloverfield movies starting with God Particle. Uh, I'm actually going to sell it. I, I, to be honest with you, I, first of all, I didn't love Cloverfield Lane. I liked it, but I heard maybe it was one of the situations where I heard a lot of people raving about it, and then I saw it, and my expectations were just a little bit too high. I thought it was a good movie. I didn't think it was all that great, and I thought the ending kind of was questionable at best. Do you need a shared universe on this? I mean, do we? Is it? Is this something that people are really clamoring for? I'd like to see JJ and his company do other stuff. So hey, look, who knows? Maybe this movie comes out and it's awesome, and we're all thanking heavens that he did it. But for for right now, it's a sell. What do you think, Shneb? I'm going to buy it. I mean, do we need a shared universe of Cloverfield films? No. But I mean, to me, it's like a, just a, a cinematic Twilight Zone. So I see that he's taking different kinds of stories and telling different stories and then vaguely attaching them. I mean, with uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane, I actually really enjoyed it. And the, the ending, you know, I'm not going to spoil it, but the weirdo ending or whatever yeah. you want to call it, the surprise ending, the Shyamalan, you know, kind of ding dong Shyamalan. ending. Um, <laughs> I didn't mind it. 
you know so I, I was like hey this is different you know but for me it was it was a fun film just like the first Cloverfield film so whatever this God's Cloverfield particle or whatever they're going to change the name <laughs> at the very end Cloverfield's particle the particles of Cloverfield whatever they're going to slam that name in there somewhere I'm good with it I would like to see like eight more of these JJ is like hey I got another he's like he could be a Rod Serling just throw up like throw on the on the board like here's like ten weirdo ideas Cl Cloverfield it up you know and they could just produce and make them so the Shyamalan kind of ding dong ending. <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to buy it, and I understand all the concerns for sure because I think that the ending is the definition of shoehorn. I mean, yeah, I was yeah, really enjoying that movie for the most part. There were a couple things I was hoping didn't happen, and it did, but that was just on me. But then the ending happens. I'm like, oh, they did that just because they want to franchise this thing. But. The reason I buy it is because I think that there's enough there that they already have started this shared universe. I mean, they started with Cloverfield and then Cloverfield Lane. They're like mm -hmm. doing this God Particle thing where they'll add more into it. J.J. Abrams is very creative that way, you know, and he's, he's really good at television. And this, to me, is, is kind of serialized with the movies, with the shared universe, and he could add new things and things that he's wanted to tell when him and Matt Reeves did the first one. I think that there's a lot of things in here that he could do, and I think that there's some fun storytelling that he obviously has an idea of what he wants this to be, and we can learn a little bit more about it, because that stuff is intriguing to me to find out what this stuff is. Is it a Godzilla-type monster? Is it aliens? Like, what the hell is it actually? Like, that kind of stuff I'm, I'm curious about. Do we need it? No. But if it's done with, with, a, with a cool director, I, yeah, I'm going to buy it. All right, guys. Well, listen, we do this show live, and as we like to do, at the end of the show, we're going to save a little bit of time to take some of your live Twitter questions. For those of you who are watching us live, you can make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and start firing in your questions to us there. Wendy will pick a couple out at the end. But I want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video today. We also have, coming a little bit later today, I believe at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the newest episode of Jedi Council goes online with this man, Christian Harloff. And tomorrow... There's a one-on-one -on -one movie trivia showdown match between Sasha Pearl Raver and People's Kara Warner. Make sure you check that out at the time. Now, this weekend is the LA Comic Con, formerly known as Kamikaze. It's now known as the LA Comic Con, and we are going to be there on Saturday. At 1 p.m., we have a Heroes panel. John Schnepp and I will both be there at that. It's in room 304, so make sure you check that out. And then at 5 p.m., there is a movie trivia schmodown panel. Both Christian and I and a whole bunch of other people will be there for that. And then at 7 p.m., on in the bar at the Lux Hotel across the street, we are going to be having a Collider video meet and greet at 7 p.m. Make sure you guys come on down and say hi to us if you're around. With all that being said, it's time for Mailbag. Listen, guys, if you have a topic or a question you want us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Natasha, what is in the mailbag today? Sam Allen writes, Hey, Collider crew. Recently, I watched the Man Down trailer, and the variety quote they used made me curious as to how it was tracking on Rotten Tomatoes. It turns out the quote they used was from a negative review. This got me thinking, are there any regulations governing the use of quotes in trailers? Can they trim this is not a masterpiece down to a masterpiece? Or when there is a no source for the quote, is that just the director's mother? Thanks for my daily procrastination. I mean motivation. This is one of my biggest pet peeves in Hollywood today, with the way this is done. Now look, <clears throat> I'll tell you right now, this whole brain dead myth going around there that studios pay off film critics, they don't. Like, you're a moron if you actually believe that. It, that does not happen, all right? But that doesn't mean that the, sometimes the studios are unscrupulous and they do some pretty underhanded things, especially when it comes to this whole topic that you just brought up, the quotes that go up. Now look, I don't think a studio I did have a situation once where something, it was not this exactly, but where I said one sentence about a movie and somebody took a section of that sentence and used it in some promotion a little bit out of context. It wasn't as egregious as this. They would have to be careful about that because let's say Christian Harloff said a movie, said about a movie, I'm telling you, this movie is no masterpiece. And then they put on their trailer, masterpiece, Christian Harloff then what they're putting themselves at risk is is Christian Harloff going online and saying, no, this movie sucks. Right. And they just drew, drew attention to that. But what I have seen them do, one of the worst situations this I've ever seen, remember that movie, The Spirit, mm. directed by... Uh, Frank Miller. By Frank uh, Miller. Paula? That movie was... No, that's uh, a oh, no, Shadow. No, 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 the Shadow. shadow. Okay, right. uh, the one directed by Frank Miller, horrible, horrible movie. And I remember watching the trailers, and it would be... Uh, 
a breathtaking spectacular, uh, one of the best movies of the year, blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, wait a minute. And I stopped and I watched. There were no creditation under any of those quotes. They just made those up. They just made them up and flashed words on the screen to make it look as if critics were saying it, but no critics were actually saying it. Another thing that happens quite a bit, you'll see like a, a, a trade commercials for a movie that I knew would be a bad movie, and all these quotes, breathtaking, a, a triumph for so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And then you pause and you look, okay, this one was from, I'm just going to make up a movie site, uh, moviesahoy.com in uh, honor of Natasha's hat. So movie, <laughs> moviesahoy.com says, spectacular. But then you pause in the next quote. Oh, the next quote was also from moviesahoy.com. And then the next quote. And then you realize all eight of these high praising quotes were all from the exact same one uneducated critic. And so that, look, no, studios do not pay off critics. They don't do that, but they do act unscrupulous. And I think that is a horrible practice that they need to stop. If you're actually to put up these bragging quotes, which I think is great if you do it, but make them legit from real critics saying real things with, and don't just put eight quotes from the one critic to make it look like tons of critics like it when only one did. I don't know. It drives me crazy. Christian, you've seen this happen I've all the time. I've seen it happen what a lot. It happened it? to Perry not too long ago too. Like Perry, there's something that Perry had said about a movie and then she, I remember walking in and she looked she's like, that's definitely not the full quote that I had. And it, things happen all the time with that with certain reviewers they'll take certain segments of it not necessarily chopping it up the way that the viewer had asked but close right. and there <laughs> and like you're saying there's a lot of times they'll take they'll make up outlets too like there's some i remember i remember there was an outlet one time i can't remember what the hell it was but i looked i was like wait what is that i paused it mm. and and that site did not exist right um so yeah it, it definitely happens for sure and they're trying to sell their movies somehow and they're trying to put these messages in there like oh it's, it's it says it's great so it must be great i think people are a lot smarter than that <laughs> to realize it and because as this thing grows in general like the the online space and getting the movie news out there it, it, people are more aware of these type of things so i think it might stop yeah, when I first started, I remember like Shay Scrimpy from Four Second Review. You know, you'd be he's like, still yeah, around. Yeah, still around. Well, I, I followed Shay for a long yeah, time. His reviews good. were always. I always went. It's, uh, anything he said was good. Right. I'd, I'd you know not go to see. I'd just right. do the exact opposite. But uh, yeah, these fake review sites that are kind of built out of nothing. Or there's also a lot of people who just give positive reviews just to get pull quotes sure. and to go get sent off to another country to be wined and dined at these release dates and stuff. So I mean, there is like it's not payola, but there's definitely a thing where it's. Like if somebody's sending you off somewhere, you're like they're like you know you're you're like are you going to shit on that you know thing? It's like well if you have integrity and you you know stand behind what you think, you're it's not you're not going to you know do that. If you're, you had a negative thing when you saw a film, you're going to stick to it, not just because they sent you somewhere. And that's that's what separates like critics from people who aren't real critics. I think you know so I mean those get weighed out in the you know but this is like about fake pull quotes dot 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 masterpiece I don't think that many places are doing that anymore I mean if they are you <clears> just have to beware like not the look out it of up. context quotes yeah the yeah. out of context quotes have been pulled so to yeah. speak they're not really doing that anymore especially because what Christian said is very true our online community now is so much stronger and so so much quicker to you could just check instantly you yeah. can go to like people go to Rotten Tomatoes or they go to a site and then they could read a bunch of different people's reviews. Did you read some of these quotes that are up there? Yes. The Ellis ones? Pretty fine. <laughs> right. Raise <laughs> the best. Enjoy the private and public lives of Ellis. Yeah. All right. What's next? SQ writes, hello, crew. Since video game wow. movies are on the horizon, could we see a Duke Nukem movie? I think if it's done well, it could be the Deadpool of video game movies. Um, absolutely not. But damn, I would love it. I would love it. Mm -hmm. I, I, unfortunately, if there ever was a window for a Duke Nukem movie to be made, it it was eight years ago, ten years ago, maybe even longer than that. Yeah. I, so I don't think there's really any chance of it now. Here's the only chance that it could. Um, we get Assassin's Creed and we get Uncharted and they're both unbelievable critical and box office smash hits and all of a sudden every studio starts looking for a video game title to prop into production as fast as possible. Maybe then a Duke Nukem could happen, but I don't really see that happening. But damn, Duke Nukem was one of the most fun, 
funny. It's fun. Like it was a game that was kind of ahead of its time a mm-hmm. little bit. And it, it the one liners in it are fantastic. They drew a lot from Evil Dead. Uh, and also to, they live. And they live. Or, or and sometimes there was a little bit of a reverse. I think. But I mean, Duke Nukem was classic. It was great. I loved. It. I would love to see a movie. I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, I think the time is gone. And even even if those two movies that you said, Assassin's Creed, and what was the other one that you said? Uh, Uncharted. And right. And they both crush. There's too many modern games out in the last like five years that there's so many different things that they could do yeah. with the modern uh, with the gaming audience out there that people would want to see before Duke Nukem. I think it's a fun nostalgia type of thing to bring out and would be would be great and it could have a lot of elements there, but I don't think people would be screaming for it the way they would other games. So I don't think that will happen. Yeah, the only way that would happen is uh, they'd have to refresh the game, Duke Nukem, right. make like yeah, a virtual true. reality. Right. Right newer like bigger version of duke nukem put that out in like 2018 then if that's a giant hit well, sure then they're gonna be like all right there's there's a desire for people to play these like you know kind of like 1980s commando style dudes with the one-liners that could be a, a viable thing but they have to make the game again first it's fantastic all right guys i said we'd save a little bit of time for some twitter questions and we're gonna do that right now once again make sure you're following us on twitter at collider video so wendy what do we have Mike Shepard writes, which Disney slash Pixar movie should not have more sequels? Cars. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What about planes? No. Well, planes is Disney. It's not what, Pixar, though. but... And even planes, though. Planes, because they're putting it on like the direct-to-DVD the way they did. And I go back yesterday, I said, my daughter was watching them. She loves the planes movies. Even Cars, she's like, ah, done with Whoa. us. Yeah, like, wow. it, yeah let's, let's... Planes Planes actually works. And they, they've got something to it. I, I, ah, cars. And Brave. Brave. They should not do a no, no sequel. Well. No sequel to Brave. How did that win an Oscar? <laughs> Especially the year it comes out against Record Ralph. Yeah. And they're both under the same company. You can't say, well, it's a Disney body. No. No, 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 no. They're both Disney. So I, I, I don't know. Record Ralph. I hope Cubert returns in Record Ralph too. Oh That's yeah. All, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's next? Berkeley the Whites writes, uh, "What are the key plot developments the Russos must bring to Thanos to frame a memorable, menacing MCU villain?" Any one of a hundred that would work. I mean, they, they, look, the, the the possibilities are endless. There's no one path to making it work. There are a million paths to making it not work. There's about a hundred that make it, that that could make it work. It's whatever they think is best for their story. It would be really premature for us to, to have no idea about the plot of the movie to say what they should do with Thanos. When what they should do with Thanos is really going to depend upon what is the overall structure and their plan for the movie. So there is no one thing that they have to do or else it won't work. I, I don't think that exists. Loss. They ha- he has to cause loss. I mean, I'm not going to spoil Walking Dead, but Negan caused loss. Mm. And that right away, you hate him. And there's a reason why behind it. It mm. wasn't just... There was a reason why he did what he did. There's a reason why there's so much hatred and what Thanos wants and the drive for him. I want to see that. I want to know that about him. I want to. I mean, I got that little bit from just just in Guardians, like the, the thing that he does, that little smirk on his face. Like there's things about him already that I'm I'm so curious about. But I want to see. One, and, and Mark calls me the Harbinger of Death. But I want to see one of the Avengers crap out. And I want. No, to I'll, I'll agree with you it. on that. I think in the er, early in the film, he's got to kill one take of the Avengers. Out. That, that to me is right because no one else can do it. Everybody yeah. else tried. I mean, I guess Quicksilver. I mean, Ultron. But I mean, one. Th- that's the only time, and everybody else comes back mm-hmm. one way or another. Thanos needs to cause damage. Even a uh, war machine fell five thousand feet. He's and, and he's fine. And no, he's fine. No, he's walking right. by in the end of the movie. Everything's fine. I don't know. What, what do you think? What does Thanos need to do? Well, I mean, in the comics, his quest for death. I think Marcus and McFeely, who are writing these uh, Avengers films now, are are big sweaties. They're big. They're going through all the comics. They're getting. They're, they're like melting all these different storylines down into what can be the the ultimate Thanos storyline. And yeah, there's sacrifice has to happen. I think so, something very big is gonna have to happen in the first 20 minutes to just push the rest of the film forward. And that could be anywhere from like something like the Dark Phoenix saga where she just wiped out a civilization mm. of five billion people. I mean, in the same sentence, you could also have an Avenger who's protecting something goes out. Also, there's a lot of damage happened. So something like along those lines, I could easily see happening because you have to up the stakes. All right, what's next? Jonathan Peck writes, what is the next movie commentary? Is it one of the Harry Potter films? Not a bad choice. That's not a bad choice. Uh, I don't think we have anything planned. No, at, I thought at, we were going to we do should. The Room. That, that's <laughs> be, whenever that movie comes out, when is this? <laughs> yeah. Formally known, yeah. Uh, oh, they pushed it back? Because uh, the Disaster, disaster Artist, artist. is what it was called. Yeah. They changed the name of it, which I thought was a great title. That's a great I'd title. I'd love to do that one. I mean, like, we already did Deadpool. 
Yeah, I mean, um, we've got to do another one pretty soon. I mean, I would. I think the one that makes the most sense would be a Harry Potter movie, considering we're getting so close. Probably the last one. But can right? we do one Harry Potter movie without doing all the Harry Potter movies? I hope so. These are conversations that probably shouldn't happen on camera. <laughs> yeah. what, about, what about all of the yeah. extended Lord of the Rings? Right. Yes! The answer is we don't know yet. We don't know yet, but keep your eyes open. By the way, guys, anytime, just you got our Twitter handle, follow us at Collider Video. Fire us some tweets. Let us know if you've got some ideas or things you'd like to see us do commentaries on sentiment. But keep this in mind. Nothing obscure, because there's no point doing a commentary on a movie that nobody you sees. You mean like Zardoz? Like Zardoz. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But send and tell us what you want to see and give us some ideas. All right, what's next? Gregory D. Voigt says, what, do you, what did you guys think of the new Tom Hanks movie, Infernal? Yeah. Meh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know what? Here's, here's what I'll say about it. It's my favorite of the three. Oh, is it? But I really didn't okay. like the other two. I was going to wait um, till Ron Howard comes back and does a fourth one in like 10 years. Then I'll <laughs> then see, see them the all together. Three, yeah, you, know. I, you know, I didn't think it was bad. I, I, I didn't. I didn't think it was bad. I walked out, thought, ah, oh, that was a night at the movies. But I'm not also going to say that it was good. Um, Great cable watch. Good cable yeah. watch. Yeah. I mean, it could have been worse. Yeah. Could have been worse. Yeah. All right. Two more. Zachary Southland writes, do you think most YouTube critics put their top 10 list of the year too early? No, because I know that I know that that's definitely been a complaint a lot. But you have to realize that we, we, what happens at the end of the year, is that studios will send whether they're screeners or early screenings. So like, well, all these movies haven't come out yet, and you haven't seen everything. We have. We it just we get them well, all, especially towards the end. Certain YouTubers do. There's a lot of YouTube critics who do not get. But those even that has invitations. changed, though. I mean, like, yeah. if you're talking about some of them, I mean, I know for a fact, like Jeremy Johns and Chris Stuckman, the guys that they get, they see it, and I know those guys personally. Also, they do not put out their list without seeing a lot of stuff. And I know Jeremy also will say that he he makes his list a little differently because there's some things where he is located he just can't get to see. So his list is based on different things anyway. So I think it also depends on the critic. It depends on what they're what they're doing but I know as far as myself and Mark are concerned we see everything first that the studio sends and then we make our list yeah I mean if you see the list come out in like the beginning of December odds are if they're a reputable YouTube film critic odds are they've seen all the films and then therefore it's not too early to put out you see any coming out near the end of October right probably premature probably yeah, I mean, for myself, I don't see every movie that comes out. I'm way more discerning. If a movie, if everybody that I trust and, you know, says do not see this movie, most of the time, like nine out of ten, I will avoid that film. So it's got to be like for myself, I come out with a list for myself out of all the films that I saw that year. It's not every film. All right, last question of the day. Last one comes from Sam Wilson, who writes, now that Tim Miller is off Deadpool 2, what kind of movie do you think he should direct next? Well, we already yeah. know which movie he's going to direct yeah. next. He's doing Influx with Fox, the same studio that does Deadpool, which was a great sign because it means it really was an amicable, amicable yeah. split between them. They so It's like a cyber thriller kind of an idea. It sounds amazing, actually. Uh, and it's, so once again, it's called Influx. Do a Google search, find all the information <laughs> on it. It actually looks really good. Yeah, it's encouraging also to see the fact, like you said, that they, they've got good relationships with the studio. I bet you Ryan Reynolds won't be in that movie though. Um, but I will. <laughs> but it is it is good to see that they still they trust in him and they want him to do more stuff with him. Yeah, I agree on what they said. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember most important part of this show is not what we have to say, it's what you have to say. Get the conversation going, jump into the comments section, leave your thoughts on all the topics we discuss here today, click the thumbs up button and share this video on your Twitter and Facebook and wherever else you use social media. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? On Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find me at Stan Lee's LA Comic Con this weekend with these guys. Collider Heroes panel, like John said earlier, one o'clock. It's we've got ninety minutes of sweatiness. We're gonna get into it. Bring some really cool questions. Let's have fun. Also follow my uh, Schnep Zone channel on YouTube. I'm gonna drop a horror film this month. Sitting right next to me, Mr. Christian Harloff at Christian Harloff on both Twitter and Instagram. Jedi Council today uh, around five p.m. The Schmo Show. We are also gonna be doing a Halloween edition. And then, like these guys mentioned, L.A. Comic Con. We've got the Schmodown panel, which is on Saturday, and then a Schmo's No panel on Sunday. Over there, we've got. 
Captain Natasha. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And Wendy Lee Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at The Movie Couple and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can simply follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram just at John Campion. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ where John Schnepp and I have our show Film HQ. New episodes drop every Saturday. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.